Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our special seminar webinar today. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, introducing Dr. Eloy Bellirano, um, who is a scientist three in the Nutrition Vision uh, Research Team at the HNRCA. Uh, Dr. Bejarano received much of his education in molecular and cellular biology from the University of Seville in Spain. He completed a research fellowship um, at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine at the Institute of Aging Research. About four years ago, Dr. Bejarano joined the HNRCA community in the Nutrition and Vision Laboratory. During his career, Dr. Bejarano has received numerous awards, including the American Society of Nutrition National Vernon Young um, International, International Award, um, sorry, Young Investigator Award. So today, Dr. Um, Dr. Bellerano is going to present his research with a vision of how his research will enhance the research agenda for the HNRCA overall. Um, the format today is a webinar and uh, we will open up the a webinar for questions after uh, Dr. Bellionaro has finished his seminar, which will take approximately 45 minutes. To ask questions, if you look in your, on the lower panel of your screen, there's a Q&A. Please use that option at the end of the webinar to ask the questions. Please note the seminar is being recorded. And we do have uh, technical support from Ed Media, who will be helping any of us with technical challenges. Please use the chat option in, um, to indicate if you have challenges. So without further ado, um, I'd like to um, pass the webinar over to Dr. Bejianaro to talk about autophagy and his vision for research in cellular aging at the HNRCA. Thank you very much, Eloy. Thank you, Sara, for the kind of introduction. And also I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to present today my research program on my previous research about uh, two major topics in molecular aging. <clears throat> As uh, probably most of you um, uh, no, I'm working in autophagy and intercellular communication, and that's the title of this uh, seminar. And these two uh, aspects of molecular aging are extremely important. Um, um, I'm sure that uh, you recognize this uh, cartoon, probably it's the most used cartoon in the aging field, the hallmark of aging. This hallmark of aging, uh, there are nine hallmark of aging, nine biological processes underlying aging, and in green you can see here that one of them is uh, altered intercellular communication and the other one in purple here is the loss of protostasis and at least partially this uh, uh, malfunction of autophagy during aging contribute to loss of protostasis my uh, research program is focused at protein level and this loss of protostasis is one of the major driver in age-related disorder uh, in healthy cells, we have uh, different molecular mechanisms that maintain the proteome, the proper level of proteins in our cells, and that's called protostasis. During our life, our proteins are affected or are exposed to different type of stressor, and the structural, the, the structural conformation of the protein <coughs> can be modified, and at some point, the protein are, are unfolded. So the first uh, mechanism that the cells have uh, are chaperones, are proteins that facilitate the refolding of the proteins. And by using this chaperone, we can go back to the original conformation and we are gonna recover the activity of the protein. However, a uh, pool of these proteins uh, are able to scale away of these chaperones and this protein start aggregating. 
<clears throat> as you know, that the formation of aggregates are part of the uh, aging, uh, molecular aging, and also these aggregates uh, contribute to the onset and worsening of age-related disorder. And in order to avoid the accumulation and deposit of unfolded protein and aggregates, the cell cells have different uh, proteolytic capacity that we are going to discuss today. Uh, and one of them is autophagy. <clears throat> so during the seminar, I will go through three different topics. Um, uh, with the first one, the first part of the seminar, um, I will try to introduce uh, autophagy, what is autophagy and what is uh, the role of autophagy during aging and why it's important to understand how autophagy play a role in the in in homeostasis in the second part i will try to convince you that this uh, degradative pathway is modulating the intercellular communication because autophagy is able to degrade the structural component of uh, intercellular channels and these structural components are called connection and in the final uh, part of the seminar uh, I will show you some data suggesting that there is a bidirectional relationship. Autophagy is modulating intercellular communication during stress, especially, and intercellular communication is also modulating autophagy in basal condition. But let's start with uh, autophagy. Autophagy, uh, along with UPS, are, is uh, an important. Um, protective mechanism because uh, it's essential for cellular homeostasis to maintain this protein. When we have damaged protein in here with this uh, highlighted in red, this protein had to be clear, had to be removed from the subcellular scenario. And what the cell does first is to, uh, to remove the protein, is targeted the protein to the UPS that uh, to the protection for regulation. But unfortunately, some of this protein escape from the UPS and start aggregating. And the UPS is highly efficient to uh, degrade cytosolic protein, but the proteasome is not able to degrade um, aggregates. So we need a different proteolytic capacity to degrade this aggregate. And that capacity is autophagy. Autophagy is the degradative um, pathway by which intracellular component like uh, aggregates, organelle, or pathogens are targeted to a lysosomal compartment for degradation. Autophagy was discovered in the 60s, and now uh, we have the vast uh, knowledge about the role of autophagy or different roles of autophagy, and we can uh, classify these roles in different functional clusters. So in here in different colors. Now we know that autophagy is important for cell defense in blue uh, against pathogen or is important for the recovery against injury. And also autophagy plays uh, an important role in during development in our tissues and organ and also in cellular differentiation and, and in, in a specific type of cell death. But during my entire career, I have been focused in the, in, in the uh, yellow box and in the green box, how autophagy provides energy under a specific condition or how autophagy is one of the major quality control systems in the cells. And it's responsible for the protein and organ homeostasis. In the last 15 years, um, um, increasing number of um, mice, genetic, uh, genetically modified mice, have shown that have shown that autophagy is important for so many physiological functions, like energy metabolism, immune response, cellular remodeling, and also how autophagy is important for nutritional stress and is extremely important in, in aging. In animals that lack autophagy or, or in, in where we have malfunction of autophagy, we have a neurodegeneration, oxidative stress, different pathological condition. And this, um, all this uh, information coming from those animals uh, induce a new revival in the, in the field. And it's not only, um, this information is not coming only from animal, from rodents, also uh, this information uh, coming from a human sample, from, clini from a clinical view, the better understanding of autophagy is important because uh, 
the malfunction of autophagy is associate, associated to, um, to many human disorders. In here on the left, you have a, a specific organ specific disease like um, affecting the central nervous system, heart, lung, in, or multisystemic like cancer, metabolic dysfunction, exosomal disorder uh, in self. But I want to emphasize here that, or point out that one of the, auto, the different mutations are affecting different autophagic proteins. And one of them is uh, P62, that is a protein that I'm gonna mention later, that is um, mutated in ALS or in Paget disease. So from the clinical view, it's important to understand how autophagy or how um, uh, occur the malfunction of autophagy in this human disorder if we want to uh, reestablish the autophagy function as a therapeutic strategy. This is in pathological condition, but also, as I mentioned, it's important in cellular aging. And um, in this cartoon, I, um, I try to uh, to show you different mm, intervention, pharmacological and nutritional intervention, uh, proved to increase the lifespan. And at first glance, you see that spermidine is affecting uh, acetyl transferases in the nucleus, C twins, the same thing in, in the nucleus, calorie restriction, a dietary strategy is affecting the mTOR pathway. We can um, inhibit mTOR with rapamycin, so apparently, everything is unrelated. There is nothing common. However, in all of these interventions, we have a common denominator, and it's the upregulation of autophagy. And practically in every single intervention that uh, proved to increase the lifespan, we have upregulation of autophagy. So there is a correlation. The more autophagy, more life, lifespan. But probably the most compelling evidence uh, linking uh, autophagy or the lack of autophagy and aging came from the different animal model, transgenic model. And for example, in C. elegans, if we overexpress master regulator of uh, autophagy genes, the master regulator is TFAB, we are able to increase the lifespan. In the worms field, uh, they have characterized lonely mutant. So if we knock down, the autophagy uh, function by using RNA uh, interfering technology, we have a decrease in this uh, lifespan. Similar results were obtained in other models, in Drosophila, in flies. If we overexpress autophagy proteins, we have an increase of autophagy. If we pharmacologically enhance autophagy by using rapamycin or by using resveratrol, that is a dietary component, we have an increased autophagy. And this, uh, sorry, increase, uh, enhance uh, lifespan. So if we uh, delete the autophagy function again by using NRA, NRA interference, we can diminish this lifespan. This is in lower organisms, in worms and flies, but also happen in, in, in a mammalian context. And now we have at least three different type of mice in the literature that uh, show that more autophagy we have, more lifespan and more health span. So uh, in this slide, I want to emphasize how conserved is the process from yeast to mammals, and also um, how in mammalian context we can extend the lifespan more than 20%. That is a remarkable uh, amount. And when we talk about uh, autophagy, uh, we are speaking in singular. And when we say autophagy, we try to say macro autophagy because uh, now it's well accepted that in most of the cell types, they say uh, coexist different type of autophagy. The most important one, quantitative and quantitative, quantitative and qualitatively, is macro autophagy. For macro autophagy, it requires the formation of the autophagosome. It's a double membrane structure that uh, trap some cytosolic uh, proteins, aggregates, organelles. And um, once the autophagosome fuses with the lysosome, the lysosomal proteases degrade the material inside the autophagosome. This is an inducible uh, type of autophagy. There is another inducible type of autophagy that is called chaperone-mediated autophagy, CMA. 
uh, after prolonged starvation, there is an activation of this growth. Um, cytosolic, frax, uh, cytosolic proteins containing uh, targeting uh, motif, that is a QFRQ motif, are targeting to electrosomal sulfate and translocated into the lysosome for degradation. And finally, there is another type that is called microautophagy that is highly conserved from these two mammals. And in this case, uh, microtophagy is the direct invalidation of the lysosomal compartment. For the purpose of the seminar, I'm going to focus exclusively in macrotophagy, what people usually call autophagy, that, um, as I say, require two uh, things. One is the formation of the autophagosome, and the second one is the fusion with the lysosome for degradation. We can classify um, different subtypes of uh, macroautophagy based on the based on the type of cargo that we have inside. So, uh, if we have targeting of um, lipid droplets, we can call it lipophagy. If uh, mitochondria are targeted, we can say mitophagy. If ribosome, ribophagy, etc. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you a collaboration uh, within the building in where we have explored the role of autophagy in the degradation of lipid droplets. Uh, that collaboration is, um, is with uh, Andy Greenberg Lab uh, and, and John. And we have tried to explore if autophagy is important for the degradation of lipid droplets in a specific model that they have in the in the laboratory that is a plin 2 knockout animal and this uh, plin 2 is a protein that cover the lipid droplets here and um, this model is quite interesting because if we do not have li uh, perilipin 2 uh, in this this model doesn't respond to diet induced uh, obesity or diet induced hepatic estatosis um, so one possibility is that, uh, that and we want, wanted to know if autophagy is participating in this protective um, effect. So in, during uh, lipophagy or the degradation of lipid droplets, these uh, lipid droplets are engulfed in this autophagosome and autophagosome fused with the lysosome and fatty acids are released into the cytosol for oxidation. And in this splitting to knockout animal, we have a high rate of fatty acid oxidation. So the first thing that we did in this uh, project was to knock out uh, autophagy or pharmacologically inhibit autophagy. So by using uh, chloroquine, that is a pharmacological blocker of autophagy, mm -hmm. you can see here that plin 2 knockout has no uh, higher um, fatty acid oxidation rate anymore, suggesting that autophagy is important for the process. So we evaluate that with different type of um, assays. And in here, you have uh, data uh, from ex vivo analysis in, in liver tissues, but also we uh, track the, um, the hepatic function, uh, the hepatic autophagic function by staining with different markers. And I think, I believe that you can appreciate here that is in the plin to knockout animal, we had much more, much more autophagy that compared to the uh, control animal. All this experiment helped to, um, to write the manuscript that is always submitted in where we show that there is a combination of autophagy and, and uh, cytosolic lipases in this protective effect. Different type of or subtype of autophagy is the degradation of aggregates that is called agrephagy. And I have participated in, during my postdoctoral stay in New York in two different projects, uh, focusing the clearance of neuropathological proteins. As other uh, autophagic cargo, these proteins are uh, engulfed by the limited membrane, forming trap in the autophagosome, and in the autophagosome, the autophagosome fused with the lysosome, and the, the neuropathological proteins are degraded. So in collaboration with um, Dr. Wong uh, from Singapore University, we identify some molecular determinant for this targeting. And now we know that the ubiquitinization 
of uh, these pathological proteins is an important determinant factor to uh, favor the recruitment of autophagy related protein, to favor the engulfment and trapping in the autophagosome, because this ubiquitinization modifies the mobility of the proteins. And these proteins are associated to the autophagosome, and this autophagosome had to find the had to find the lysosomal proteases, and that happened in a perinuclear region that uh, we call entrapment zone, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Sherman from the BU from Boston University, and in this uh, study we identified different molecular step and molecular determinant required for the formation of the entrapment zone, in where lysosome and an autophagosome decrease the motility and favor the fusion. But also, I, uh, this is one of my major projects in, in our team. Uh, I'm working in the degradation of specific um, aggregates that they are induced by diet. And these uh, aggregates are called uh, advanced glycation and products in here, ages. And these ages are formed by the interaction between glucose or sugar metabolite with different biomolecules. And these ages are cytotoxic. So in a healthy cell, in, when you are young, your system, uh, your cell have different system to clear, to de de degrade this cytotoxic compound, including UPS and autophagy. Even when we are not sure about what molecular determinants are, are important for this clearance. But during aging, we have a malfunction of the proteolytic capacity. So we have a high formation of ages. These ages are interacting with other proteins and they are forming aggregates, oligomer, fibrils. Uh, they contribute to the onset of some age-related diseases like AND, Alzheimer, etc. So obviously the, there is a aging context because we have a decline of autophagy, uh, of proteolytic capacity, uh, especially autophagy. But there is another context, that is the nutrition context, because if we have unhealthy diet, western diet, we have a uh, high level of blood glucose, and this glucose are going to increase the formation of ages. So in aging, we have two different detrimental processes, less degradation of ages, and if we have unhealthy diet, more formation of ages. So uh, something that we believe is that we can, if we are able to um, increase the capacity of this proteolytic uh, pathway, we will be able to uh, alleviate ages-derived um, toxicity and ages-derived uh, dis disorders. So uh, working with Gemma in, in Nutrition and Vision Research Team, uh, we have identified and a specific uh, autophagy uh, pathway that is P62 selective autophagy that is important for the clearance of these ages. Um, in here, you have an analysis of localization. So when we are blocking the fusion between autophagosome and lysosome, we have here an accumulation of ages in this discrete concrete vesicle autophagosome, and they, and they are positive for P62 that is an autophagy receptor involved in the targeting of aggregates. So uh, we wonder, or we hypothesize, that it's possible that P62 could be important for the clearance of ages. We have used, we have used different um, cellular models and animal models that lack uh, P62. So if we don't have this type of autophagy, you can appreciate here in liver of this mice, for if this mouse, that we have much more ages compared to control, or in the whole body of oh, in the whole body of um, worms that lack P62, we have much more accumulation of P62. So this result indicates that P62 is important for the degradation, and we wonder if we can accelerate the degradation of these ages by regulating autophagy. So we have used different models again. But in here, you have the pharmacological upregulation uh, with rapamycin. And this upregulation of autophagy is uh, sufficient to protect against glycation derived toxicity and is enhancing viability. So, well, we are already submitted this um, project also for a publication. 
um, in this um, part, in the first part of the seminar, uh, I want you to take some message, a take home message. And this is, aging is uh, important, is relevant, and autophagy is important in the aging context. So if we want, if we want to know uh, how uh, this uh, autophagy process happened in aging, we need to know how this autophagy process happen in aging to uh, develop um, useful strategies, anti-aging strategies. Because in aging, there is a malfunction of autophagy. But to be honest, it's unclear how many mechanisms, what is the molecular basis of this malfunction. And we published in 2018 in, in aging cell that at least partially the, the malfunction is due to a problem in vesicular trafficking. In here you have uh, this vesicle in, in blue, it's an autophagosome, and these autophagosomes are formed in the periphery of the cell, but they have to move from the periphery to the perinuclear region. And for that, it's required the participation of <clears throat> motor proteins. The, the motor protein that is described to participate in the motility of autophagosome is dynamic here in pink, and we can isolate different, if we isolate different uh, autophagic vesicles, here you have autophagosome, this double membrane structure, here you have lysosome, and here you have autophagolysosome, and once both structures fuse, you can appreciate that dynein is present in only in autophagosome and autophagolysosome, but it's not present or almost not present in lysosome, suggesting that other different motor protein could be involved in the in the motility of the lysosome. Something that we found that was um, uh, important, was relevant uh, in the aging field is that the association of this uh, motor is age dependent. And dynamic uh, is if we isolate autophagosome from three months animal, uh, three months old animal, we have association of dynamic to this autophagosome, but this association is reduced in uh, autophagosome isolated from uh, 22, 24 month old animal. All, um, and what happened with the lysosome? We corroborate that in lysosome isolated from liver, that the amount of dynamic is extremely low in this lysosome, but we found a huge enrichment of KIPC3. That is another uh, protein, minus M motor protein that could be could be participating in the mobility of the of the lysosome. So next, uh, we show that that's the case, that KFC3 is um, here decorating the lysosomal compartment, KFC3 is in red, is decorating the lysosomal compartment in green that is positive for cathepsin and lungs. And with the idea to mimic what's uh, happening here in urinating, we decide to knock down KFC3 in vitro in different cell types. And what we see, and this is electron microscopy, is that if we lack KFC3, there is a <clears throat> dramatic, um, um, dramatic morphological changes in the cell. And if you appreciate here, we have some um, black dots. But that when you amplify these black dots, these dots are mitochondria and functional mitochondria. We found that if we have a lack of KFC3, and I'm not gonna show you the data for a matter of time, but uh, we found that in cells knocked down uh, for KFC3, there is a lack of motility of a lysosome. We have lower level of autophagy, and especially we have lower level of mitophagy. And the mitochondrial content in the cell is compromised, and it's something that happened during regular aging. So as a summary for <clears throat> this, um, the summary of this work is that we have, we identified two different uh, minus M motor proteins in autophagosome, the motor protein is dynamic, as uh, reported before, and in the lysosome, we identify a novel protein that is KFC3. In both cases, uh, there is a decrease in aging, and something that was also important is that we can partially rescue the association of this um, motor proteins 
by starving the animal. So we believe that the nutritional status is key to uh, determine the association of this motor protein and it's something that um, I have for future uh, direction in my, in my projects. So next, I'm gonna show you the different subtype that we call connexivity. And this is the degradation of uh, intercellular channel from plasma membrane into a lysosomal compartment. And that brings me to the second part of the talk, where I'm gonna show you how autophagy uh, modulate or some data to convince you that autophagy is modulating this um, gap junction intercellular communication. So uh, I'm gonna introduce you first the character of this story, the, the connection family. Family is a, the connection is a family uh, of protein for past transmembrane protein with N and C cytosolic. As other proteins, transmembrane protein, they are uh, synthesized in the ER, they are moving through the Golgi, reaching to the plasma membrane. And in this case, <coughs> uh, ME channels in two different cells dot each other and they are forming this uh, channel, intercellular channel. Uh, that the accumulation is called gap junction plaque, as it say here. Um, what is interesting uh, from the cell biology uh, view, and I am a cell biologist, is that this intercellular channel are responsible for uh, the electrical and metabolic coupling in all of the tissues. But it's also important for a clinical view because um, here in this cartoon, we have the different members of the family that they are distributed in different uh, tissues. And in many of these uh, proteins have been identified uh, different mutations associated to human diseases. And also uh, in during aging, normal aging, there's an imbalance of this gap junction permeability, although we don't know what is the uh, molecular um, aspect behind this, mal this malfunction. So one of the uh, way that is used uh, to the cell to modulate the level of uh, intercellular channel here in, is a gap junction here, uh, is the degradation step. We can modulate the level of protein in, in the nucleus, in the synthesis by post-articulation modification, but so many papers uh, recently uh, reported show that the degradation stress is one of the key factors during stress. And now we know that um, cabianchon, this channel, can be targeted to the lysosome by regular endocytosis or by macroautophagy. It's unclear why we have this redundancy, and also something that was known is that uh, in the plasma membrane, there is a process that is independent of ubiquitinization or other process that is ubiquitin independent. So I'm gonna show you some data that prove that the ubiquitinization of connexin is one of the molecular determinants for, uh, for the autophagic degradation. So the, the first question is, um, how autophagy contribute uh, to the degradation of connexin, or if autophagy contribute to the degradation of connexin. So we found that connexin are present in autophagy vesicles or are highly enriched in autophagy vesicles. We also found that if we are upregulating uh, autophagy by uh, uh, through our starvation, we have an increased content of connexin in, in these autophagy vesicles. And also, if we block the process of autophagy, we have an increased amount of uh, connexin in the cells, and especially they are uh, remaining in plasma membrane. So we wonder which kind of pool of connexin is uh, degraded by autophagy. And I try to summarize most of the result or most of the finding here. If we knock down the autophagy function, if we avoid the formation of autophagosome, what we found is a huge enrichment of channels in plasma membrane. And that could happen uh, by two different possibilities. One is that autophagy could participate in the protein quality control of connexin, and some of this monomer of connexin can be targeted 
to autophagous zone for degradation. If we don't have autophagy, we favor the transit to plasma membrane and we are favoring the formation of channel. That's a possibility. The other possibility is that the protein already in plasma membrane is the pool affected by autophagy. And autophagy is degrading the internalized connection from the membrane of the cell. In order to elucidate between these two possibilities, we use Lindain, that is a, is a pharma, pharmacological uh, way to enhance or uh, upregulate the internalization and the degradation of connection. And by using this drug, we found that the protein is the one in plasma membrane. That's the pool. I'm just going to show you briefly a few data about this, this uh, type of experiment. But when we are treating the cell with um, Lindane, you can appreciate here that there is a significant decrease in the amount of connection. And this uh, connection is the one located in the plasma membrane. Mm. In the very early step of treatment, we have acute internalization. And then during time, there is a um, degradation of the protein, and we are losing uh, staining or connection. So we can block the autophagy function by using 3-methyladenine pharmacologically. And when we use 3-methyladenine, we abrogate the effect of uh, lindane. We can uh, avoid the, the degradation uh, or the decrease of this uh, connection in presence of lindane. What happens if uh, we are um, genetically modifying autophagy? If we don't have ATG5, we are not formed any autophagosome. And by using mouse embryonic fibroblasts uh, without ATG5, you see that you can see that the treatment with Lindane has no effect. In other words, autophagy, <coughs> in the, the internalization or uh, degradation of connection 43, in this case, because that's the model that we use here, uh, by Lindane is blocked when autophagy is impaired. So we were able to identify that autophagy is an important, play an important role in the turnover of uh, plasma membrane uh, connection. And this is important uh, also in vivo, or we show in vivo that that's the case because we can not count uh, the autophagy function in liver by using this uh, animal model, uh, 87 albumin cree. Um, this is the level of connection in, in hepatocyte by immunohistochemistry. And this protein is not a major protein in, the, in hepatocyte. However, once we have blocked autophagy, we can see a huge increase of connection in the membrane of this hepatocyte. And I'm not going to show you the data, but uh, we know that this protein in the plasma membrane is not uh, it's not only um, enhanced the content, also the, is functional. So the lack of autophagy uh, induces an alteration in, in direct intercellular communication. And that's what uh, we found in collaboration with Dr. Pereira's lab uh, from Coimbra in Portugal. And during regular condition, basic condition, this intercellular channel are present and are communicating the cells. As I say, they are responsible for metabolic and electrical coupling. However, once we activate autophagy, in this case by starvation, these channels are targeted to the autophagosome for degradation. And we will, able to, <coughs> we will be able to identify um, the molecular uh, players in this process. Now we know that at least during uh, nutritional stress, during starvation, uh, net four is ubiquitin, ubiquitin, uh, the, the ubiquitinization of uh, connection uh, happened throughout net four. That is the ubiquitin legase. The next step is the association of EPS15 that is associated to um, ubiquitinated connection 43. And the association of this endocytic uh, receptor, EPS15, favor the association of the recruitment of autophagy machinery and this. Um, that help uh, for the internalization of connection and finally for the degradation. So as a summary for this part, uh, now we know that autophagy modulate the level of connections in plasma membrane and the gap junction permeability throughout this channel. 
in a ubiquity independent manner, especially during um, nutritional stress. And something um, remarkable, something interesting that we found when we isolate this um, autophagosome from fed or a star animal is that um, the unusual accumulation of this connection. Uh, in here we have three because this is uh, the three connection um, in, in hepatic tissues. And you can see that there's a huge enrichment. And this enrichment is similar to uh, the enrichment to, for LC3 too, that is uh, a structural component of the autophagosome. So we wonder if um, those connections could participate in the formation of autophagosome. And that's the third part of the, of the seminar where I'm gonna show you a few uh, results indicating that connection is interacting with autophagosomal protein. So the, in the process of uh, formation of autophagosome in the autophagosomal biogenesis here, uh, we can uh, divide or we can differentiate different uh, type of autophagic structure. For example, we can identify pre-autophagosomal structure that is only positive for ATG16. It's a very early marker for autophagy. We have mature autophagosome that they are exclusively positive for FC3. And we have also intermediate structure positive for both markers, AT16 and LC3. What we found is uh, that um, connections are present in mature autophagosome, something that was expected because they are degraded throughout autophagy. We also found connection in this intermediate structure, but Something that was surprising is that we found that connections were present in pre-autophagosomal structure. If we knock down the internalization of connection by blocking the, by uh, lowering the level of APS15, this endocity adapter, you can appreciate how AD16, this pre-autophagosomal pre marker, are associated to connection 43 plaques, connection 43 channel. So the proteins are in the same place, but we wanted to know if the proteins are interacting with each other. So by using immunoprecipitation, you can see that if we uh, immunoprecipitate endogenous connection 43, we can pull down fraction of this pre autophagosomal structure and the reverse uh, IP is also true. If we immunoprecipitate AT16, we also can pull down some uh, connection 43 suggesting that um, connections are interacting in here in a very early step of the process. So in light of this interaction, uh, we hypothesize that autophagy was promoting autophagy or was um, providing some pre-autophagosomal structure for the autophagosomal biogenesis. In other words, if we don't have connection, we were expecting less autophagy. However, what we found uh, was exactly the opposite. On the right, uh, you have a battery of techniques that I'm not gonna go in detail, but I'm gonna focus exclusively on this one, that is an autophagy reporter. And by using this reporter, we can identify autophagosome in yellow here, and uh, in red, autophagolysosome. Once we fuse with the, once autophagosome fuse with the lysosome. The more red panta you have, the more autophagy you have. And you can appreciate here that when we do not have connection 43, what we have is more autophagy. So all these results, electron microscopy, FC3 flat by water blotting, endogenous um, identification of autophagy vesicle may us to change our mind and change our hypothesis because connection were not enhancing autophagy, connection was inhibiting macroautophagy. And in this study, uh, we identify the region, we map the region of connection that is important in plasma membrane for this inhibitory effect. We identify that uh, phosphorylation of connection is important, um, but for the purpose of the seminar, and to finish the seminar, uh, I try to summarize the two papers together. So um, in here, we know now that autophagy is modulating the level of 
intercellular channel, intercellular channel based on connection, especially during stress. And in basal condition, these uh, connections in plasma membrane are interacting with autophagic related protein and they are controlling the level of autophagy because that's important. We need to have a proper level of autophagy uh, every time. So why this is important during aging? Coming back to the first slide, because the two systems, these two subcellular processes are important in the aging field because they are two of the two out nine uh, hallmarks of aging. And um, we believe that um, if we are able to modulate the autophagy activity, we will be able to restore the intercellular communication in, in this alter intercellular communication in aging or in aging related disorder. And also uh, our uh, study revealed that connection could be a therapeutic target uh, to restore this autophagy uh, this uh, uh, malfunction autophagy in aging. So if we found, if we are able to find some nutritional component that they are able to uh, reduce the level of connection in plasma membrane, those components probably are enhancing autophagy. As I showed you before, the more autophagy we have with aging, the more lifespan and health span we are gonna have. This is my uh, final slide uh, and where I show the picture of my family in the Bronx, the Cuervo Lab, and here. And, and in this picture, I show you the, the nutrition ambition research team where I'm working uh, right now. And the bunch of collaborators that participate in all these studies. So based on all this data, I have generated my own research program. And some of the questions that we have is uh, to identify the molecular determinants and post relational modification that determine the contribution of different proteolytic systems, autophagy, endocytosis, and other different type of autophagy that I didn't mention today. Other question that uh, I would like to explore is, uh, is in the context of the aging, because if we have a malfunction of autophagy, what we expect to have is uh, an impact on the Labiation intercellular communication. And the final aspect that uh, I'm exploring right now in the center is how um, different type of uh, nutritional stress could affect the gap junction permeability, the turnover of this uh, intercellular channel and the function that the channel have in the, in the plasma membrane. So this is my last slide and I will be happy to take any question or comments. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much, Eloy. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but what we're going to do is we're going to hand over the question and answer to Eleanor. Um, so people, please, if you have questions for Eloy, um, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Um, while we're waiting for Q&A, Eloy, can you, um, I'd like to take the purview of being the host of this webinar. Can you just provide us a tiny bit more insight into how you see nutrition fits into your model? You mentioned it at the end and it would be nice to have some more specifics. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, we have or I already have some preliminary results indicating that glycative stress is affecting the turnover of intercellular communication. So uh, we have in in the nutrition ambition team we have a model that is um, that is a low glycemic index model versus high glycemic index index model, and in, with this model uh, is a model of um, AND H macular de degeneration. Uh, age related macular degeneration. And in this model, what we found is that in retina of this animal, we have much more um, connection 43. And this is something that was unexpected because uh, in the, uh, based on the literature, what we expect is the stress is inducing uh, upper, uh, down regulation of the, of the protein in plasma membrane, but we have more. And in collaboration with uh, Rebecca Shek, in, also in Taft University, we try to um, discover 
how glycation of connection uh, impair the internalization and the degradation of uh, of those uh, intercellular channels. So some of experiment that hopefully I uh, will be able to to run once uh, we come back uh, to the center is a functional analysis of uh, of cells uh, during glycative like, stress. That's one of the, the model that we have in nutritional stress and the other model is hypotoxicity. So if we have high fat diet, what we as chronic high fat diet, what we expect is a malfunction in, um, in autophagy. That's something that is published. And I, I, I would like to see or to explore how this malfunction in different tissues can modify the intercellular communication or the gap junction permeability uh, in different tissues and how uh, that could happen in, in an aging context. So this is the two models that now I'm working on, like active stress and like autocyst by health and diet. Thank you, Ilo. And I'm going to pass over now the microphone to Eleanor as I see there are some questions coming into the uh, system. Thank you. Hi, Eloy. Dr. Alan Taylor would like to know, I have three questions so far. Dr. Alan Taylor would like to know neurodegeneration related diseases are related to autophagic function. How will you, will you work on them? Well, um, we have, um, I got a pilot grant of the HNRCA provides uh, some funding to uh, Barbara from the neurobiology team uh, and me. And now we are working on how uh, glycation uh, could be affected in the cellular communication in different tissues, especially in uh, in eye and also in, in in brain tissues. And the reason for that is that uh, in eye tissues or and brain, we have uh, probably the higher accumulation of advanced glycation and products, this toxic compound. And it's because uh, these tissues are uh, have uh, poor capacity of regeneration. So we have a lot of um, advanced glycation and products in there. So we are now exploring the, the, the how glycative stress is uh, blocking or is affecting this glycation intercellular uh, communication. And so far, the, we have an analysis in, in retinal tissues that show that the effect of glycative stress is depending on the type of connection. So now we know that high glycemic index and, uh, and low glycemic index diet are differentially uh, expressing connection. And we are working on that in collaboration with, with Barbara in, in, neuro, in, in, the, in association with the Neurobiology Lab. And we expect to see the fat malfunction in, in GLIA where Connexin 43, one of the most important connection uh, is, is, is highly expressed. So probably the high glycemic index could have some effect in glia or in the accumulation of advanced glycation and product in neurons and impairing the trafficking of connection. But it's something that we are exploring right now. Thank you. So Dr. Greg Dolnikowski asks, um, does increased blood sugar increase or decrease connections and autophagy? Uh, it's something that we are exploring now. So what we have found is that uh, increasing a uh, low level of, uh, of sugar at traditional level, at least in vitro, decrease the level of um, connection. But it's something that is not really well explored in the, in the literature. There are some papers published in, in Boston University and in other, in other labs. Um, suggesting that uh, sugar is impacting the levels, but we don't know how. We have much or more adjunction permeability, but also we have the other different strategy or other different consequences. We have high level of sugar in this highly differentiated tissues. We are going to have much more advanced glycation and product, and the glycation itself can interfere the trafficking of these um, channels. So it's something that we are working uh, on that uh, right now. So I, the question is that we have difference, but I cannot claim now if it's going in one direction or in the other. It's depending on the tissue profile. Okay, thank you. Dr. Mitch McVeigh would like to know, do you have any thoughts about how the connections might modulate gut barrier integrity during aging? That's an excellent question. Because uh, 
mm, today I say gap junction in the cellular communication. This is one type of cellular junction, there, but there are other ones like type junction, desmosome. And I have preliminary result uh, coming from my um, postdoctoral training in where we have an interaction between um, gap junction and type junction. And the reason is that connection 43 is interacting with occluding and with uh, e-coloring. So I believe that if we have an impact of nutrition of aging in gap junction, we are gonna have some consequences in, in the type junction. But it's something that, again, it's a future direction in my research program. Okay, uh, Dr. Zhang Dong Wang has a three-part question. Uh, what is the mechanism for how autophagy, um, I think that's supposed to be modulate connection 43? I didn't, I didn't understand the question. Is how what autophagy modulate connection for three? Yeah, so what mechanism or how does autophagy modulate connection 43? The, <clears throat> the mechanism is that during starvation or during nutrition, different nutritional stress, there's a hyper ubiquitinization of the protein in plasma membrane. This ubiquitinization accelerates the internalization, the targeting at the degradation into the lysosomal compartment. So um, there is a basal level of ubiquitinization in basal condition, but, but when we have a higher uh, level of targeting into the autophagosome, is during nutritional stress. And then how does connections, uh, specific connection 43, can it regulate normal, both normal cells and cancer cells? And is it good or bad? Well, that's an excellent question because connection 43 is a therapeutic target for uh, cancer. In cancer cells, uh, if we overexpress connection 43, we can uh, reduce the formation of the tumor. So uh, what is published is that there is a decrease in connection 43 probably this, connect, this uh, decrease is enhancing the capacity of the cancer cell uh, to resist and to survive. So if we are able to uh, induce a blockage in that, in that membrane, probably we can block at least the process of tumorogenesis. But um, that's a really good question. So and then the last, sorry, the last part of his question is, and then there's one more after this, any nutrients, um, can any nutrients regulate connection 43? Yeah, there are some papers, some micronutrients uh, modulating uh, connection 43. Vitamin K, some flavonoids, but all the papers that I found uh, were done in vitro. So we don't know too much about in vivo. So I really like to see if these uh, micronutrients are, are important in an in vivo context and in aging context that we don't know. But that's a great question. And then the last question is from Andrew Reeves. Besides life health span extension, has pharmacological activation upregulation of autophagy been shown to help with symptoms of Alzheimer's or other protein aggregate related diseases? Um, yeah, uh, there are different ways to activate autophagy. Uh, uh, in there, I say rapamycin, but there are other ones like trialos. And uh, all these uh, compounds have been, at least in neurobiological disorder, been protected. But uh, I don't know how much is done in an aging context because most of the time what, um, what the researcher does is uh, do is uh, try to cure Alzheimer in young animals and or animal expressing a specific protein. I know that rapamycin is working uh, pretty good in, in some models, three allos too, but not in the aging context. What we have now is a, uh, we have a start, uh, started the collaboration with, the, with Rich Miller, that is one of the director of uh, Aging Center in Michigan. And we have now, or we will have probably, hopefully uh, tissues from animals treated with rapamycin, uh, all animals, and we are gonna explore the how uh, some protein could be glycated or not, and some neuro, neuropathological protein too. But um, I don't know too much about um, how a pharmacological um, um, activator could affect um, the process or the, the clearance of neuropathological protein. Uh, that's not my, my flaw. 
So I think, do believe that's the uh, completion of the seminar and thank you everyone for the wonderful questions and Eloy, thank you for a very stimulating uh, seminar. I also want to thank Andy from the AV support who has made this a very smooth webinar and I want to thank all the participants uh, for joining us. Um, this was the first of a series of webinars and we really appreciate your patience as we uh, transition from face to face to virtual. So again, thank you Eloy for a wonderful seminar and I wish everyone a wonderful rest of the day. Thank Take you, care, sir. Goodbye. Bye.